Well, it's week three in this series. As we're getting ready for Christmas, it's this season called Advent. And the focus on this in this series is on the light of the world. We started the series talking about how the light comes into the darkness, as John chapter one describes, and how the darkness does not overcome the light. The light of the world has come into the world, and it's Jesus. Well, last time, as we talked about this, we talked about the difference between light that is produced, like the star or the sun at the center of our solar system, and light that is reflected off of something else, like the moon. And I thought it might be interesting to show you a picture of the light, that lesser light, the moon, that shines over the city of Jerusalem. This is the western wall or the wailing wall there. It's a sight that Jesus would have seen, Paul would have seen, early Christians would have seen this very thing from time to time, a beautiful harvest moon over the city of Jerusalem. But the moon is itself not a light, it is merely a reflection of the true source of light, which is the sun. Well, the passage of scripture we're going to be looking at today is going to be talking about that very thing. But before we get into that, I thought it might be interesting for you to know That as this gospel was being written so many centuries ago to a group of Christians in a Jewish world, the Jewish people had actually believed for a long time that they were the true light, knowing that God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. There was a legend among the Jews that God had offered the law to the 70 other nations of the world, but they had all refused it, and only Israel was his chosen people. Well, I don't know that that legend is accurate, but the Bible does tell us that Israel was God's chosen people, that they were called to be a light to the world. But the question is, were they really the true light of the world? After all, if you know your Bible very well, you know that Israel rejected God. In fact, in the 8th century, the the nation of Israel to the north turned to the gods of, their foreign, of the foreign nations, and they worshiped them instead, Baal and Ashtoreth and others. And so God rejected Israel. They were defeated by the Assyrians, and then Judea to the south, the city of Jerusalem, they also did the same thing. And in 586 B.C., the Babylonians defeated them, and they, their king was removed, and they were from then on a persecuted and oppressed people. But out of that situation, the prophets had predicted that a a, a shoot would come out of the stump of Jesse, is the way the prophet Isaiah describes it, that, that a Messiah in the lineage of David would come. And as they began to think about that Messiah, one of the ways that they would describe him is as a light, a true light. In fact, one of the scriptures of the Old Testament that we know they were looking at as an example of this is one that's in the it's, it's found in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17, which speaks of a star of Jacob coming out. Well, that particular prophecy was applied, we know, in the, in the, early, uh, in the early period to a man by the name of Simeon bar Kassaba. Uh, in the, about 130 AD or so, the rabbi Akiva declared that Simeon bar Kassaba was Simon bar Chokhba, which means son of the star, and he led a military battle against the Romans. It led to really what might be called the first great holocaust. Well, we know about this because the coins of Bar Kokhba have been uncovered by archaeologists. These coins show that there was this mass movement, and we read about it in the the history books of, of the Roman period. We know that Bar Kokhba led this revolt with 120,000 Jews who were a part of the Jewish uh, militia. In fact, 400,000 in total against six of the Roman legions that came into the, into the land of Israel to fight against them, more than 120,000 Roman soldiers. In the process, more than 200,000 Jews were killed or enslaved and more than 580,000 Jews total were killed in 50 towns and 100 villages. Now, all of that to tell you that Simon bar Kokhba may be the best example of a false Messiah in all of human history because tens and tens and tens of thousands of Jews lost their lives. But it was all built around a strong Jewish belief that the Messiah was going to be a star, that the Messiah was going to be a bright light, or put another way, he was going to be a true light. 
Isaiah 9-2 had said about the, the land of Galilee that a, a light would dawn in this valley of darkness, that a light would come, and the Jewish people had hoped for that. Malachi 4-2 had spoken of the son of righteousness who would rise with healing in his wings. There the word sun is S-U-N, the star at the center of our solar system, a messianic text. And so at the time of Jesus, the time when this gospel was, was being written, the Jewish people were hoping for, longing for, that in the midst of this darkness, indeed, a star would come, a light would come. Well, John is going to tell us that who this true light is, is he's the word that was in the beginning that made everything, and he became, as we know, flesh. But before he goes into that, he says this, starting in John chapter 1, verse 9. He says, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And just notice Notice those words, true light, how important those are. That gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him. What an incredible statement, right? The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, in reference to the Jewish people. The, the very same people who, as you will remember, didn't accept him. In fact, they handed him over to the Romans to crucify him. He, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the exousia in Greek, the, get the word executive from that, the right or the authority to become the children of God. What does this passage mean, this business about a true light coming into the darkness? Well, today what I want us to do is Pretend for a moment that we're journalists and we're asking the journalistic questions to try to figure out what John is telling us about the true light. And the first question is the question of what? What does this mean? What is he talking about? You know, I, uh, several years ago, I lived in a house where the closet where my shoes were kept didn't have a light in it. And so from time to time when I'd get dressed, my clothes didn't quite always match in fact, I remember one, one time coming to church and walking around and somebody coming up to me and looking down at my shoes and said, Pastor, are you wearing two different colored shoes? And when I looked down, I could see one was black and one was burgundy. And in fact, I, I was. I was embarrassed. But then I just really understood why. It was because I didn't have a light that would show the difference between those two colors. Uh, sometimes it's helpful to step into the sunlight and see what something's true colors are. When we're talking about true light, we're talking about uh, more than just the distinguishing between artificial light and sunlight, maybe between lesser light and sunlight, or maybe between black light and some other light. We're talking about something more than that. Because when John describes to us that Jesus is the true light, the really important word there is true. In fact, this gospel wants desperately for us to know about the truth. Uh, that, that question comes up in that great Ecce Homo moment as the artist describes this particular painting. This is the moment where Jesus is on trial before a pilot and the, his entire uh, questioning process goes on and he has to give witness to who he is and what he's doing. And, and Jesus says this to Pilate, who says to him, you're a king then. Jesus answered, you say I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world was to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And then Jesus said this, we can put this on the screen. Or Pilate says this, what is truth? You know, Jesus said, hey, I'm the truth and I came to bear witness to the truth and I came to tell you the truth. But Pilate asks one of the great questions of the Bible, what is truth? Well, we ought to ask that question. What is truth? You know, never before in the history of the world have we had access to more information than we do today. I mean, you can literally search the internet for just about anything you can possibly imagine. We have more information than we can possibly sort through. In fact, somebody will say, well, I'll just, I'll Google it. And a lot of times when you Google it, you go to find something on maybe Wikipedia or some other source of information, 
and you have no idea really if it's the truth. In fact, my, my favorite coffee cup is the one I got that says this, please don't confuse your Google search uh, with my PhD degree. And I, and I have that cup, and I think it's kind of funny, but it's, in a way, it's, it's true sometimes for me as a pastor. Somebody will come up to me, and they'll say, well, pastor, you said so-and-so, and I Googled it, and it said something different. And I'm like, well, Google doesn't really necessarily know everything. Google doesn't study the primary sources and hasn't spent years trying to, to understand what it's talking about. And, and this is one of the problems is we can have a lot of information but not actually know if that information is true or not. <laughs> the, the, the religious people of Jesus' day, they had a lot of beliefs and they had a lot of information and they had a lot of knowledge, but they did not know the true light. They did not know the truth, and Jesus will tell us that he came to reveal that truth because he's the light of the world. Look what he says in John eight twelve. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. That means to live in the dark about, who, about the truth, but will have the light of life. In fact, what the Bible shows us is that when it comes to the question of what is truth or what is the true light, it is not the question of what. It is actually the question of who. Truth is not about gathering information. Truth is actually personally revealed through that relationship we have with the author of truth himself. Truth comes to us through the one who is himself truth. That's one of the great things the Bible shows us. In fact, you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and there's God and Adam and Eve. And what do they want to do? They want to eat from the tree of knowledge. The knowledge of good and evil. They want information. They don't want God. And you know the world has been doing that ever since. They're, they love facts and figures. But what about faith in the one true God? Well listen, that's what Paul says in Romans chapter 1 verse 18 that the entire world has done. Is they have rejected the true light, the truth. And they've replaced it with all this other information. That's really nothing more than a little bit of fake news if you will. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 1.18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who do what? Who suppress the truth. The truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known, I mean this is, if you want to know the truth, it, if you want to know that, it, it, it's, it can be known. In fact, he says it's plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. That's what John's saying here. It's what the psalmist says. and says the heavens declare the handiwork of God day after day, night after night. They pour forth speech. There is no language where they're not heard, where they're not experienced. Everyone knows the reality of God but they suppress that truth, he says, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became empty or futile, and their foolish hearts, look at the word he used, they're darkened. We're talking about light, but their hearts have been darkened, and although they claimed to be wise, they became, what he says here, are fools, and they exchanged the, immortal, the glory of the immortal God for icons, for idols, for images, made to look like mortal human beings, birds, animals, reptiles. You go, will go into all of the temples of the ancient world, and they're worshiping all these gods, and, it's, and it looks like an animal or something. And he says, those aren't the light. That's not the truth. That's not the real God. That's just a fake imitation of the real living God. He, he, he's not an object sitting in some temple somewhere. He made everything. And if you want to know truth, you're not going to find it in one of those places. You need to know the author of all truth itself. In fact, that's one of the things the scripture wants us to understand in this passage in John. It says that he came to his own, but they didn't receive him. But to those who did, he gave them the right to become the children of God. Now I want us to ask this question. 
It's the question, how? How can I appropriate this truth into my life? In other words, it's not enough today to just know that that Jesus is the light of the world, that Jesus is the truth. It's not enough to know that. We have to appropriate that into our life, and the Scriptures talks about that. It says that, that, that they were confronted with the reality of Jesus, but they didn't receive him, and they didn't believe in him. And so just seeing Jesus or knowing there is Jesus is not enough. We've got to appropriate him into our life, and the Bible describes that we do that by faith. In fact, at the beginning of the book of Romans, Paul's great theme text is Romans 1, 16 and 17, where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And then he makes this statement, first to the Jew. Jesus Christ came first to the Jewish people. Paul came first to the Jewish people. He'd go into a city, he'd go to the synagogue. But he says, and then to the Gentiles. And they didn't expect that. That was a surprise to them. They weren't expecting for that to take place. They never saw that coming. Well, I want us to think about that for just a moment. You know, I, I grew up in East Texas, and when I grew up, we grew up out in the, in the country, and, you know, in the summertime, my dad would take us boys, and we'd go out into the, around our house, we had all these big trees growing up, and we'd go out there with a chainsaw, and we'd cut down the trees, and we'd chop them up, and we'd stack up big wood piles. And when winter came, we'd burn that in the wood-burning fireplace, and that'd keep our house warm. But in the springtime, I can remember walking out among all those used-to-be trees, and and all you have now is just a stump sitting there in the ground. And in spring, you'd begin to see things come back to life. And every once in a while, you'd see one of those trees, and a little shoot would come up out of that that tree stump, and you began to realize that it, it only looked dead, but new life was coming up out of that. Well, do you know that that is what the Bible describes God's plan for his people? That they've been, they've been loft off like a, like, a, like a piece of wood and all they are left is a stump. But out of that stump of Israel, God is going to raise up a, a shoot. And the Bible describes that as the Messiah. Jesus is the one that's going to bring new life out of what has only been death before. But the people believe that the Messiah was going to come just for the Jews and just for the Jewish nation. But what the Bible reveals us is that God had another plan, that he knew that they were going to reject him, and so he was going to become the Messiah, not just of the Jews, but of the whole world. In fact, in Paul's magnum opus, the book of Romans, chapters 9 through 11, are among the most important parts of the entire Bible in which Paul explains all of this. And he uses precisely that metaphor of a, of a stump and of an offshoot and of a branch. I want you to see that in Romans chapter 11, verse 17, where Paul says, as he's writing to these Gentile Christians in the, in the ancient Roman city, where they're gathered all over the city, believers, almost all of them Gentiles, describes them as like branches that have been grafted in. Look at this. If some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, hey, you Gentile Christians, you're no descendants of Abraham. You're not part of God's holy people. You can't trace your ancestry back through Moses and all of this. You're like a wild olive shoot that has been grafted in among the others. And you now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, from the stump of that tree. Do not consider yourself to be superior to other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. Hey, listen, know where the, your life comes from. It comes from Jesus, not you. He's the star of this solar system. You'll say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief. And he's like, listen, you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble, he says. For if God did not spare the natural branches, hey, if he cut off Israel, if he sent them over into Babylon, if he sent the Assyrians to destroy them, hey, be careful. He won't spare you either. Don't just think, hey, I've been grafted in. I'm okay. I don't have to worry about anything. No, you do. And that's the image that he uses to describe this. Now, how do we get grafted in, in Paul's language? He says it is by faith. We stand by faith. We'll go back to John chapter 1. And later on in that verse, verse 17, 
John will say this. He says the law was given through Moses. All the Jewish people believed, hey, if you follow the law, he's the true light. Moses is the true light. The law is the true light. But look what it says. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Hey, listen, the law has some truth in it. It's got some information in it that we need to know. It's from God. It's a revelation of God. But John doesn't describe the law as truth. He describes Jesus Christ and knowing Jesus Christ as having and knowing truth. In fact, this gospel is the one that tells us in John 14, 6, I am the way, Jesus said, and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father through me. They would have never understood that. They'd have said, oh no, we come to God through the law. If we follow all the commandments, if we do all those things, if we follow all the rules, we can be right with God. And he would say, no, no, those are all lesser lights. Those are just... Those are just night lights. Those are dim lights, maybe even black lights, because the one true light of the world has come, and it's Jesus Christ. And if you don't know that true light, then you do not have true life. Now let me ask you one last question. It's the only question left worth asking, I think, at this point, and it's the question of when. It's the when in your life can you say that there was a time when you believed and received Jesus Christ as the light of your life, where you have accepted him as your one true light. Now, you might say to yourself, well, I've been going to church. My parents were Christians. That isn't, I mean, that's, that's nice, but that doesn't make you a Christian. You know, Billy Graham used to say, just being in a garage doesn't make you a car. Just coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. Just listening to this doesn't make you a Christian. Just having Christian family. You know, somebody said God has no grandchildren. All of us must be able to say that we have believed and received for ourselves not all these lesser lights, but the true light, Jesus Christ. Has there been a time in your life when you could say, I have done that, I have believed and received Jesus into my life? Well, I want you to know that this gospel tells us about a man who was struggling with that very same reality. His name is Nicodemus, and we read about him in this gospel. He was a Pharisee. He was trained in the law. He had followed the lesser light of Moses, and he was following all those instructions. He was a a very knowledgeable man, and he came to Jesus at night, and he asked Jesus a question about how he could enter into the kingdom of God. But Jesus said to this man of great religion, this man who was raised in the synagogue and and worked in the temple and lived among all these religious things, that he still hadn't found the one true light until he personally accepted Jesus Christ himself. Listen to what he says in John chapter 3. There was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, and he came to Jesus at night and said, Teacher or rabbi, we know you're a teacher who's come from God. For no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one, and look at the word he used, can see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. You will never see the true light until you experience the new birth. Is there a time in your life when you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and received him to be your savior, to be your Lord, to be the one true guiding light of all your life? If you, can't, if, you can say, if you can't say that you've done that, I want to ask you right where you are right now, would you consider having that conversation with God right now to say, you know what, I need to do that, I want to do that. How can I do that? What does that look like? Well, for a lot of us who've made that decision in our, our lives, whether we were six years old like I was when I first did that, or maybe you're 60 years old, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, Nicodemus wasn't young when he made his decision. It, you do it the very same way. You do it by faith. You put your trust in him. You know, around here we say that it's it's about as easy as your ABCs. You admit to God you're a sinner. You believe that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross. And you confess and commit your life to following him as your Savior and your Lord. He becomes the true guiding light of your life. And you can become born again. Would you pray this? uh, Would you pray with me right now? Father, I just pray right now. Maybe for someone who is watching this right now. And more than anything in their life right now, they need to be born again. They need the 
the light of life to come into their life. Lord, maybe they've been following some lesser lights. Maybe they've been, maybe they've been guided by some, some dim lights, some night lights, some dark lights. But now they've come to follow the one true light. Lord, would you hear their prayer? Would you hear their heart today as they speak to you and open their heart to you to put their faith and their trust in you? Lord, will you help them understand that, they're, that that trusting in you is an experience of, of, of new birth as life is being born inside of them. And right now, like, a, like, a, like a, a shoot coming out of a stump, new life is being is being birthed inside of them and they're entering into your kingdom and becoming a part of your forever family. And I pray that now in Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know, if you, if you right now are making that decision, we'd love to know that you've made that decision We'd also love for you to know that you have an opportunity to be a part of a group with other believers who are growing in their faith. Uh, you know, we sometimes call them Sunday school classes or small group Bible studies, but they meet online as well as in person. And we'd love to share with you information how you could get involved in one of those. We also would, would, would love for you to know that you can be present here on campus. If you're local, uh, we have services on Sunday morning at three different times in person, and we'd love for you to come and, and join us in person. Uh, we'd also love to hear from you if you have prayer requests or prayer needs uh, that, you, that, that you have that we can pray for you. Maybe there's a specific area of your life. You just need someone to encourage you in what you're going through right now. But we also want you to know that, that you can actually join our church digitally. You know, when you become a Christian, you join God's forever vertical family. But we would love for you to be a part of this family, uh, the, the members of the First Baptist Church of Waxahachie. And you can do that right now digitally as well. And we also want you to know that you have an opportunity to support the ministries of First Baptist Church. You can do that online. You can do that in person by dropping that off or you can mail that support into uh, our mailing address here at the church, and we'd love for you to be a part of that. You know, we say around here that when you do that, you're a part of helping people to find God, helping people to be changed, and help people uh, to make a difference. But I also want you to know that right now we're also in this campaign for our 515 offering, which we do in the month of December. Uh, this is a special offering that we give toward missions. We want to give first uh, to missions to support the ministry of our church outside the walls of our building. And our goal this year, as was last year, is $515,000. And so we are asking our, our, our folks to make a special offering in this month of December and knowing where that is going to support the mission of God here and around the world so that First Baptist Church and you and all of us together can help the light of the world reflect into all of the world. 